good now. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of today, um, which is given by Zuber Kakarel. Um, and he uh, will talk about RV FPGA SOC. Uh, just a few words on the presenter. Um, Zuber received his uh, Master in Science uh, in Embedded Systems Engineering from the University of Leeds in 2013. He has since worked as a Linux kernel engineer and team lead for various organizations, including Imagination Technologies, who are sponsoring this uh, event uh, right now, uh, MIPS and Balena. So Bear founded a software consulting firm, ASCII Labs, from uh, Labs in 2020. And currently, he and his team are delivering software solutions in a variety of areas using cutting edge tools and platforms. So Bear is passionate about giving back to the community and sharing his learnings. So, Zuber, thank you uh, for presenting today, and uh, your, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Julian. All right, so uh, today we're going to be talking about RVFPGSOC and how we can go from a RISC V core to a RISC V SOC. Uh, okay, so uh, I understand that most people would be kind of quite familiar uh, with this, uh, but I'll still go over a few basics. Uh, and just highlight, establish a bit of a baseline. And the important thing I'd like to highlight is that there is a hierarchical sequence here. So lots of RISC-V cores exist. These are the CPU core itself. Uh, if we add a few other things to the CPU core, such as a DDR controller, interrupt controller, interconnect, SPI, these come together to form a system on chip. And if you get other things together, such as a clock crystal, power supply, memory, those types of things, uh, these components come together on a board and become a development kit or an embedded system. Okay, so we start with the CPU on the left, add more jigsaw pieces and become an SOC, add more jigsaw pieces and become a board. All right, so now the challenge, uh, the RISC-V ecosystem is amazing when it comes to openly available code and designs. There is lots of CPU core designs openly available. Generally, a CPU uh, core itself will come with a reference system on chip. Uh, as, otherwise, it'll be pretty hard to work with the core uh, without a reference kind of working example. Uh, so however, what is usually available is the, the end result. Here's the CPU core, here's the system on chip. A lot of material is mostly focused around the CPU core itself and its architecture. Like this is how the cache is done. This is how this is what's unique about this particular core and this part. Uh, the process of how the system on chip itself was made is not that obvious. Okay, so material around it is not that readily available in an easy form, particularly when it comes to teaching. Uh, so just to reiterate, how we went from a CPU core to the whole system on chip design uh, and how do we teach this uh, material. So this is the challenge. And this is what we are trying to address uh, as part of our VFPG SOC. So our solution is to create a set of teaching materials. We take a CPU, Swerf EH1. It's an industrial CPU by Western Digital. Uh, we take an SOC, Swerwolf X. Uh, it, the work is targeted to Nexus A7 for the, phys the physical board and very later as the simulator. And uh, the overall concept, of course, it's kind of any board simulator. Uh, and we explain how to go from Swerve, the CPU, to Swerve Wolf, the SOC. OK. So just to kind of give a high level outline of what the whole RVFPGA course includes, it's a set of five extensive labs. Okay, so we start with the lab one, the introduction to RVFPG SOC. We go into lab two, running software on RVFPG SOC. Uh, and then we take us in lab three, we take a slightly different approach uh, to generating an SOC using some build tools uh, that's Fuse SOC. And then in uh, lab four, we build and run Zephyr, a real time operating system on Swerwolf. And uh, in lab five, we run TensorFlow Lite uh, just to have that hierarchy, we'll keep that hierarchy in mind. We started with just the core, we built the whole SOC, we ran some bare metal software on it. And in lab two, we ran, uh, we generated another SOC using some build tools. 
And then we went to, uh, we started running an RTOS and then we started running some machine learning uh, libraries on top of our SOC, okay? So uh, we're gonna get, dig deeper into each lab and I'll show the materials. But first I'm, first I'm gonna do a little bit of a slightly quick pass on all the labs. And then we're gonna go in depth into each lab and just go through them a bit, okay? So lab one, it's a visual approach, okay? Just we walk through the entire process of connecting the CPU core, adding the clock, the reset, the interconnect, boot ROM, GPIO, all the components, it's very detailed and we go step by step one wire at a time, okay? So just this one wire at a time, one block at a time. How do we just start with nothing, the whole blank canvas? We add all the various blocks that we are working and then we start wiring them up, okay? So the visual approach in lab one was taken to facilitate the teaching process overall, okay? So in lab two, uh, we in lab one, we were looking at just the RTL side. In lab two, then we start running some bare metal code on uh, our SOC. So we both the uh, Nexus A7 target or the simulator target. Uh, the simulator target is pretty interesting as well that you just run a simple assembly code, uh, an ALU or some simple instructions. And you can see the whole like, okay, the clock has started. The instruction has gone, uh, has been fetched from the boot ROM. It went into the CPU and it's like, okay, it's some, some stuff's happening. It's coming out on the, the, on the bus. So you can see in simulation, uh, but of course you can also do it on a real hardware as well, okay? So in lab three, uh, we take a slightly different approach. So the visual block design approach is great for learning and educational purposes. Uh, however, in the industry, designers and teams of designers will usually be working on the Verilog code itself and sharing sources in a version control system. Or, or they'll be using some kind of framework or build system to generate the SOC first, and then they'll add some, start tuning the SOC a bit. So Fuse SOC is a package manager and a set of build tools for HDL code. Uh, in lab three, we use Fuse SOC to generate the same similar SOC. It's, it's Swerwolf. It has a few extra blocks. Lab one, the manual wiring approach was quite long. So we removed things like a UART or SPI or a few extra blocks. The, the generated approach is just easy. You add a few lines of code and it's like it generates and connects the IP block. So uh, Swerwolf uh, from Fuse SOC is a bit more feature rich compared to the one that we created using the block time design approach. Okay, and uh, lab four. So wherever there's a CPU, there is some software running on it. So lab two was showing just a bare metal example, but generally in the real world kind of application, industrial applications will be using some form of a real-time operating system. And there are many real-time operating systems, uh, but Zephyr is an open source RTOS. And in lab four, we show how to run Zephyr on Swerwolf. So just to reiterate the hierarchical nature of the work on the right, uh, we start with the uh, Swerve, the CPU. Then we have an SOC, Swerve Wolf. Now we're running a real-time operating system on our SOC, okay? So, and moving one step above the hierarchy, uh, lab, five, lab five takes things to another level and it runs a TensorFlow Hello World example on top of Zephyr. So while we started with the CPU, Swerve CPU core, we go to SOC, we run an RTOS, and then we run a simple Hello World TensorFlow example, just to demonstrate the wide end to end picture. Uh, just to loop back to the introductory remarks, uh, we a lot of material out there is about the core and inside the core and the reference design. But in, in our VFPG SOC, we were looking at, okay, how do we go wide? and how do we look, focus on the SOC part as well, okay? So that was the, uh, one of the focus areas. So uh, before going into the labs, uh, I'll add that there are, these, there are actually two courses by imagination, two sets of teaching materials. RVFPGA is the part which focuses more on the internal CPU aspects, okay? Uh, the IO, CPU, 
the hazards, cache, memory hierarchy, lots of areas inside the CPU itself. RVFPGA SOC is focused on what you just heard about the five set of labs and the end-to-end -end kind of large overall picture, all right? So let me just see, okay. So now I'm gonna switch to, uh, I'm gonna try and go through each lab in a bit more detail and uh, Let's see. So we'll start with lab one, where we'll spend a bit more time. Okay. So just to reiterate, this is a set of teaching materials, and the audience is uh, students as part of a graduate or maybe an advanced undergraduate, self-learning or being taught. So it's a bit kind of it's quite in depth. Okay. We start with an introduction. Uh, we introduce the SOC that we're trying to make. That okay, this is the swerve complex. We have an AXI interconnect. We have the AXI to wishbone bridge. Uh, we have the wishbone interconnect, and then we have some IP blocks that we are connecting. And here's the address map itself. Uh, now, it's like the boot ROM is at this address, the system controller at this address. So the, some of the aesthetic ones are peripherals added. It's just a difference between the Fuse SOC approach and the Lab One approach. There is detail about what's in in the block design approach and what's uh, part of the kind of generated core approach. So uh, we go in depth and uh, start with, there is a separate installation guide, which goes into the, how to install Vibardo, uh, install like a very later platform IO, all those sorts of things. So in the labs itself, it's, uh, it's kind of, it starts with the creating the project and then when, uh, how to select the right board, go ahead, adding all the various files in the sources, the XTC constraints files. And then once we get to the exciting part, uh, here, we start the block design. So we open a particular block kind of thing. Okay, start add this IP block into the uh, block design and add the interconnect block, add the boot ROM block, add the GPIO block, system control, all of these various blocks. And then we have this kind of large picture uh, of uh, the block design canvas is filled. Okay, this, these are all the components that we're gonna be wiring up. This is how, this is what makes up the SOC. Okay, so now moving forward, we're gonna start wiring things up one wire at a time, just to understand, okay, we're wiring up the instruction fetch unit. We're wiring up the load store unit. So we start wiring up each module one wire at a time and kind of go. And uh, because it was hard to condense everything in the dock itself, especially because uh, it, it, it's easy to get wrong. So we also provide separate high quality PDFs, which are partial PDFs, okay? So by partial PDFs, I mean, there's like, okay, if there's one particular bus that we're working at, so we're like, okay, there, there are, this is a partial PDF showing how to, uh, connect the instruction fetch unit uh, from the Swerve CPU to the interconnect wrapper, okay? So each uh, further kind of connection also has a partial PDF uh, of it. Okay, if we are connecting the RAM, so this is the partial, these are the set of pins. So as you go through the lab, uh, high quality PDFs are kind of like specifically linked. This is the one to open and you'll see this connection in a zoomable kind of fashion and see. So uh, we keep going instruction fetch and keep going with lots of like load store unit. So as you can see in this image, it's, it's just not legible. Even if I try to zoom this PDF anymore, it won't work. So that's why the, the actual block design, the partial block design, you could potentially just look at the partial block designs and see the kind of SOC forming afterwards. Okay, we connected this, we connected this, we connected this. Okay, so if I then you just keep going and adding the first, wave is harder in a sense that the, the swerve to interconnect connection and then each individual small IP block, it's a, actually slightly kind of simpler. Uh, the boot ROM, uh, the system controller, which is like the uh, interrupt controller and those types of things, and the GPIO connection, GPIO controller. Uh, this part gets a bit very intense. Uh, in Verilog, it's a bit easier, but in the block design adding 16. It's basically, if you were connecting just one GPI, it would have been easier, but these are 16 of them. So there's, it's one replicated and just connecting externally again and again. Okay, uh, don't wanna miss the clock, the reset, the JTAG debugger module. 
uh, RAM, of course. So you just start wiring, okay, this, the clock goes from, so you can see the whole clock signal uh, throughout the SOC. You can see the reset signal throughout the SOC everywhere. And you can see the RAM is connected to external pins. And uh, now at, after the end of this exercise, uh, we, we, we're like, okay, we've now gone from Swerve and now we have Swerve Wolf, uh, the SOC. Okay. And this is the part which was like kind of not as kind of readily available generally. So uh, there are of course like other little pins uh, and this, this whole lab basically is quite detailed generates the whole synthesis part, the bitstream and everything, okay? Uh, it does, uh, it, it's quite long. So the software part is not here in lab one, okay? So uh, the software part is actually uh, the bare metal part. It's also a different context. Uh, when working in uh, SOC and this part of area, sometimes you wanna kind of switch back and forth between C bare metal code and uh, Verilog, it gets a bit confusing. So generally it was like, uh, uh, I'm looking at Verilog now and I'm looking at C now. So it's the, this is a context switch. So lab one focuses on the whole Verilog RTL part. And uh, it, because it's also kind of easy to get wrong, uh, we do provide a reference working full project as well. So uh, although it's in the, as some instructors can kind of retain it before the lab, and not provide it and maybe provide it at, at like 24 hours after the lab happens so that, the, that nobody's left behind because it's quite easy. Uh, if you look at the whole uh, with the kind of large picture, yeah. So it's it's easy to kind of accidentally mix up and uh, SOCs don't work if there's a wrong wire connected. We, we know from experience, they don't work. <laughs> One wrong wire and they don't work. Okay, so moving a bit forward to lab two, Okay, this is the part where we uh, run bare metal code on our SOC that we just created in the block design. So again, very in-depth, step-by-step. Uh, there are uh, refer to the installation guide. So each lab require has a different requirement. So lab one required Vivardo to be installed. Lab two requires Visual Studio Code, Platform IO, GTK Waves, very later Sigwin, if Windows. So uh, there's an installation guide which kind of guides people separately as to what do we want to, uh, what is the requirement for this lab. Uh, and then we kind of like have uh, two pathways here. Uh, the two pathways are, are we using the simulation wrapper or are we using the Nexus wrapper uh, to target on a real board on, on the Nexus A7. So uh, we then kind of keep going. Uh, we let's focus a bit more on the very later pathway here. So uh, there are a few set of steps to connect with our design to very later and run very later to generate uh, the trace file. Okay, and once the trace file has been generated, uh, the simulate first we generate the simulation binary, and then we kind of generate the simulation trace uh, from using platform IO. So there's a lot of different tools so, and it's quite like Visual Studio Code, Platform IO, very later, GTK Wave. Uh, but once, uh, so as a result, the actual, uh, this bare metal code is quite simple. It's just an add uh, ALU instruction or something. So uh, once we get the trace and then we focus more on the trace itself as to, okay, open it and uh, see the clock signal, see the instruction fetch unit signal, see this, these signals going in, these, these signals I'm looking for, this image, yeah. So we kind of go from, we built our SOC, we went, we started with the swerve, we added boot ROM, we added the interconnect, we added all these components, and now we just loaded uh, a bare metal code, and now we are seeing our instructions, we're seeing the, the whole clocks that we wired, we're seeing the clock happening, the whole, uh, instruction fetch unit and boot ROM we connected. We are seeing the instruction being fetched from the boot ROM. Uh, we're seeing the instruction happening, executing the CPU is working. There's an execution happening, a uh, simple ALU example, and we're seeing it have uh, kind of the output as well being saved. So uh, again, for that was the very later part. And we could do the same for the Nexus A7 as well. Uh, the reason I was focusing on the very later, you can see inside what's happening. When it's running on the board, like uh, it's, it's just running, you can't see what's happening inside from a teaching perspective. Uh, both are necessary because there's a separate set of learning that's needed 
to run on the on hardware as well. You can't just leave with the simulator part. Okay, so LED blink. So, so the sim, yeah, uh, the actual board one is not an ALU; it'd be useless. So the the board one is an LED blink example. Okay, and let's continue a bit to lab three. All right, so lab one. Uh, as you can imagine, all the wires, uh, one bit at a time, quite uh, not just tedious, error prone as well. Uh, a mistake is hard. And it's also not that kind of industry standard to kind of like just manually fiddle. I mean, little components, yes, the whole SOC can be a bit tricky. So uh, a lot of the industry uses a set of build tools and uh, teams or uh, a common set of sources like some version control system like Perforce or some or various other systems to kind of like who's uh, making what line edit and kind of merge together and then compile and run automated tests. So lab three is kind of takes a step away from the block design and focuses on the, it does a pros and cons a comparison between the advantages of the doc, block design and disadvantages. So block design is easy to understand teamwork can be challenging, okay? So various other things. So there is an advantage to hand-tuned code. It's, it can be very specific to the fabrication process and you can use version control systems, but there is a steep learning curve as well. And it requires the team to be have like a, on a nice wavelength as well across team chemistry as well. Now with COVID times and everybody remote, it's a bit of a different area as well. So uh, continuing a bit forward. So Fuse SOC is, uh, a package manager and a set of build tools. Okay, so you basically uh, describe the SOC you want to do, or you want to build and uh, run build, <laughs> not build, fuse SOC, and then uh, it kind of generates the entire Vivardo project for you. Okay, so uh, there is a bit of work to kind of the, the interface part, but for Swerve Wolf, that's done. So it's it's this easy kind of set of uh, instructions, and it's the same. The address map is a bit different. Uh, compared to the one that we were building in the block design. Uh, but it's uh, kind of generates an SOC, which is slightly better in a sense that it has more, it has a UART, it has more blocks connected to it. Uh, again, both for simulation and for the uh, Nexus uh, A7 target. Okay, uh, the, the core part, Swerve, uh, AXI interconnect, uh, Wishbone interconnect, boot ROM, GPIO, all common some peripherals like UART extra and uh, some some little, little changes. So we walk through uh, the environment setup running Fuse SOC. Uh, this uh, part gets a bit uh, Linux specific. You can use with Windows subsystem for Linux to an extent, uh, but that's a separate uh, area. So uh, we, we generate the whole uh, thing in lab three, generate the the RTL equivalent of what we did in lab one, we generated using Fuse SOC. And then we also run the same uh, bare metal examples. So we were trying to run a uh, verilator and the arithmetic logic part so we, and generate a trace and open the trace. So we do the same exercise on both sides uh, just to provide a nice kind of learning comparison. Okay, we went through lab one, we hand wired everything. We went through lab two, we ran bare metal code. And now we're in lab three, we generated uh, a, a slightly better SOC using a set of build tools. And we are now running the same bare metal example using uh, our new SOC, which Fuse SOC generated. Okay, so, excuse me, just to facilitate the overall learning process. Uh, again, that was just GTK wave very later side, and we're now in the Swerwolf Nexus side uh, for the target as well. So there is like, just to highlight a key difference in memory maps, it's just to like various things, but each thing is very detailed. Uh, just to remind again, the audience is like self-learning people, graduate students, or it's a set of teaching materials. Okay. So platform IO, let me, I believe that covers lab four, lab three. Uh, the debugger is open OCD. That part is covered as well. Okay. Now, taking a bit of a step forward into lab four and going up the hierarchy, 
So up until now we were running bare metal code and that's kind of, there's a, it's great, but there's a bit of a limit on how complex of a bare metal kind of exercise you can do. And a lot of the common practice is to just use an RTOS and lots of libraries, uh, pre-built kind of assembly blocks and those types of things. So uh, Zephyr is an open source RTOS. Uh, we introduce it a bit, not too much in depth because there is a lot of other helpful material about RTOS and Zephyr. Uh, but we do illustrate the hierarchical nature of what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, in lab one, we were starting with Swerve, and now all we've, we're starting to run an RTOS uh, on our SOC. Okay, so uh, we kind of go through, Zephyr has its own set of kind of build and understanding process. So we go through the build itself and running Zephyr on the, uh, the basic Zephyr Hello World example, which just prints it on the UART, uh, prints the Hello World on the UART block. So we go through the, uh, the build cycle running Hello World and both uh, target for the simulator, very later simulator, and for the uh, Nexus A7, apologies. It's a bit late here. I'm speaking in the future because it's Sunday here. <laughs> you guys are all on Monday. So uh, yeah, we uh, target uh, the whole work to uh, both simulator and the Nexus A7. So Zephyr provides the ba two basic examples, hello world and an LED blink. But we also uh, provide, uh, if you wanted to pro uh, program your own uh, kind of example, this is how you would do it. So if you want to run your own source code, this is this is some example helpful boilerplate. This is how to modify the make file. This is how to add a bit of source code in the make list. This is how to add a project configuration file. And this is how to configure your code. And this is how to kind of like build your own app. So it's easy to run like, okay, we built Zephyr, we ran hello world, but then it's like, what now? So let's do it. Okay, no how to make your own app, your own C code uh, that's running as part of Celsius. So we went, went go through that process as well as part of lab four that uh, make a folder. This is how you can figure the project file and this is how you run. And then you just kind of provide that kind of boilerplate as well for your kind of, uh, potentially you could take hello world and just start modifying it. Uh, but it is less learning here. We want to kind of provide, okay, how to create a project uh, and start kind of building there as well. Okay, so moving one step forward. Oh yeah, one before I go in lab five. So uh, Zephyr kind of uh, pro, uh, in lab three in Fuse SOC, we had we also had the UART block, and Zephyr really uses UART a lot. Uh, Artos is in general UART is like the print K is like the favorite kind of debugger. Uh, for everyone is just print something. So uh, we can see on the serial console, uh, both for simulator and for uh, the Nexus A7. Okay, so moving one step ahead. So now we started with Swerve. We make the whole SOC. We ran bare metal. We ran an RDOS. And now we want to run some machine learning example just to get provide like it's a, if you want to have a very large complex library running on top of our RTOS, the most the best example was okay let's run some machine learning so it's just a hello world for tensorflow light uh, but it is there okay so again the hierarchical nature of the work and it kind of gives a whole nice breadth to, uh, so because it's easy to kind of get stuck. Oh, we have this risk five CPU and we know about the CPU, but in real world applications, nobody really knows what uh, CPU is inside my television. It could be a risk five, it could be something else. It's like the user somewhere else. There's a whole kind of hierarchy of software and uh, layers of things happening here. So uh, we walk through the TensorFlow uh, setup process. Uh, it's a bit intensive. Uh, and then start compiling a TensorFlow, compile the whole ELF file, and then just a basic hello world example, and uh, kind of run that, uh, again, both for simulation and for the Nexus A7 target as well, okay? So yeah, th this one I believe was a 
sine kind of example, uh, the sine function. Uh, yeah, program prints x and y coordinates of the sine function that the TensorFlow model is plotting. Okay, so that was the end to end. We, I, 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 it can be a lot to take in. We start with lab one where we have nothing and just a swerve CPU and we have, we're starting machine learning on the whole end. But that was the objective. This is an area which is kind of less kind of highlighted uh, throughout the work. So let me switch back to the slides and see, yes. So this was a large team effort. Okay, uh, lots of authors. So RVFPGA itself, uh, the course that is focusing on the CPU, the IO, the inside the CPU, uh, Professor Sarah Hazard, Harris, Daniel Chavez, uh, Hamza, myself, Zubair, we were looking at RVFPGA SOC, Olaf uh, built uh, Sewer Wolf, Robert from Imagination was leading the whole thing. We've been advised by Professor David Patterson as well to an extent, and lots of contributors associated, lots of sponsors. Uh, so it was a very large team effort to create this set of teaching materials. Uh, for students and universities around the world. Okay, so just some closing remarks. Uh, we went from Verilog to SOC to real-time operating system to TensorFlow. Uh, all the source code is visible. Uh, I, I I wish I had this when I was a student, uh, but well, getting old now. So uh, we have a set of five labs that walk through students on how to set things up. Uh, we So the slides say by year end, we will have SOC in five languages. I believe the next line is actually more accurate. The RVFPG SOC is already available in uh, English, traditional Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. And simplified Chinese, I believe, is just some uh, going pending some review, uh, and it'll be live as well. And RVFPGA uh, 2.0, which has adds more labs in the sister course RVFPGA, uh, will be going online as well uh, on Monday. But I, uh, let me think, you guys are already in Monday. So, <laughs> but it's still, this means Monday of UK, not the Monday rest of the world, <laughs> not rest of the world. Anyways, I'll stop talking. So thank you very much. Uh, please download and use the materials uh, from university.imgtech.com. Uh, any questions, iup at imgtech.com. Uh, we always like to hear from prospective uh, workshop trainers uh, around the world, uh, anywhere. So, uh, because uh, it is COVID times, uh, but we are doing workshops where we can and we're lining up the schedule for next year as well. So I'm gonna switch to the other part where I think I can see Q&A. Let me just double check. Uh, yeah, let me see. Here, discussion forum, presenter chat, Q and A. Let me see. I hope everybody was listening because I don't have feedback. All good here. Now we could could hear you. So okay. Like... okay. I, I was thinking, was I talking to a wall for like- No, that's the worst that can happen. <laughs> no, no, we were quite audible and very well received as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, maybe there are no questions or no chat happening or I'm not seeing them. So if anybody wants to do a live question, I'm here. No takers. Any question about the materials? Any question about the uh, how to reach out to us? Yeah, just as a comment, the 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 because this is recorded, we make this this available for watching later as well. Okay, okay. Uh, that's good. It's, so yeah, questions can come to iup at imgtech.com. Happy to answer anything. And the materials are freely available uh, you just, uh, for academia and for uh, commercial entities as well. So the, I think the commercial restriction is like very tiny about, please, uh, 
when it comes to actually fabricating stuff, you have to kind of ask or do something. Uh, but apart from that, it's it's kind of like it's very the the license is very open. So. Yeah, if, if there's no other question, I think uh, we can close the session here. Um, Zubai is, uh, is available uh, by email, as you can see, and uh, all the points are made here and we can we can record. But I'm sure also that in the um, conference portal, you might be hanging around in the next days and people can ask you uh, in, in, the, in the, um, the meeting room um, yeah. to talk to you or to, to address you. So that's another way to reach you out. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks. So, any last comment? Yeah. No. Uh, I just see a message that the simplified Chinese version has just been released as well. So. Oh, perfect. So it's it's yeah, it's Monday, you guys as well. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you, Zubaz. This is really impressive work, and I think it. Uh, propels uh, this whole uh, risk five thing quite uh, much forward to to bring it into education and actually to uh, teach uh, new students about it. So very very cool work. Yeah, I, I um, when during the whole process we were like, I wish I had this when I was a student. I wish I had this when I was a student. <laughs> I had this when I was a student. Yeah, totally makes sense. Yeah. All right, so let me. Um, I, um, I'll uh, stop your screen share over there and oh, just okay. want yeah, to sure. show my uh, my overview slide for um, for the next uh, of the day. Um, yeah, we are going to have a break now until uh, one twenty, and uh, then Bitware will be um, presenting about efficient sharing of FPGA resources in HLS. And after that, another break, and uh, to uh, the last one for today, uh, given by Intel again. Um, introduction to creating high throughput designs in an FPGA with one API. All right, everyone, uh, have a good rest of the day and see, the, see you in the next sessions. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good. Thank you, everyone.